A.C.I. He got me seeing soul. They high birds in my eye beams, but I've been living blindly. Gave my soul up for perfect timing. A desert cat reinvented rhyming. How crazy is that? What's going on everybody? Welcome back to my channel. So today we are going to be going through a deep dive of Resident Evil Village. Now this will contain spoilers. I'm about to ruin the entire game for you. So you are being warned right now. If you do not want spoilers, then you need to leave right now. Now I will be going over the gameplay first. So if you want to stick around for the gameplay, feel free. I'm going to try to keep it spoiler free but i probably will fail epically fail at doing that so again spoilers don't get pissed don't come at me in the comments if i just spoiled the game for you with that being said i actually didn't hate this game i'm kind of surprised i i honestly thought i was going to be really disappointed now maybe that's because I had my expectations very, very low, especially after Resident Evil 7. I know a lot of people love Resident Evil 7, but I am a classic RE fan. This is going to basically be Resident Evil 8 through the eyes of a classic Resident Evil fan. Now, you might be thinking, okay, instantly right off the bat, this guy's probably about to just crap all over Resident Evil 8. That's actually not true at all because like I said, I actually enjoyed it. Now, it still doesn't quite feel like a Resident Evil game to me, but to be fair, it does feel more like a Resident Evil game than Resident Evil 7 did. It is rumored that originally this game was actually going to be Resident Evil Revelations 3. And I actually believe that after playing the game simply because there are some story elements that happen that make it seem a lot like a Revelations game. If you haven't played Resident Evil Revelations 1 or 2, uh, they're kind of like an episodic kind of uh, game. It's almost like a TV show where they have like episode 1, episode 2, episode 3, and the whole trope behind it was pretty much there was always like some crazy revelation, hence the name Revelation, in those games. And that happens to happen in this one as well. And that is actually why I honestly believe that rumor. And it basically just got upgraded to becoming Resident Evil 8 when it was never going to be Resident Evil 8 to begin with. Now they're saying that this is supposed to be a trilogy. And when we get into the theories part of the video, I will go over why I kind of think that is going to be stupid if they go down the road that I think they're going to go down. But also why it could make sense. So with all that being said, let's just go ahead and jump into the gameplay. 
the first thing I want to talk about is something that is not going to affect all players. It's really only going to affect PC players because I happen to play this game. I played it on PC. I couldn't get an PS5. I, I couldn't get a Xbox Series X. They're just too hard to get right now. Not like I'm playing on a weak PC. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't have the best PC in the world, but I at least do have like an RTX 3070. I have a Ryzen 9 and I got 32 gigabytes, blah, blah, blah. I should be able to play this game at its highest settings. And for some reason, the game chugs. It's weird. It's like when you start to aim down sights, you know, when you're about to shoot something, it slows down to like 54 frames per second what the fuck is up with that i have no idea but the moral of the story is that obviously they made this game with the consoles in mind and another reason i can tell that's true due to the way that the menu is set up the way you exit in the menu is you push the right click button and for most games usually push the escape button so why they included this just blows my mind another thing is the way you navigate through it you have to go around click little tabs not like oblivion in that sense where in uh, elder scrolls oblivion it was definitely designed for consoles so it made it really hard for you to actually navigate through the menu well not hard per se but just annoying and time consuming and obviously that's what they did here mouse and keyboard is supposed to be superior to a controller but for some reason it actually ends up being way faster if you actually have a controller as opposed to using a mouse and keyboard. Why Capcom decided to do this, I have no idea. Well, you know what? Yes, I do. They probably just wanted to save time and so they just implemented the exact same user interface for each one of the different versions of this game. I really hate it when companies do this but it is what it is and it's something that we will probably never be able to change. So this is the first PC Resident Evil game that's actually implementing ray tracing. And the thing is, is it doesn't quite work the way that it's supposed to work. So due to that, everything looks actually almost lower res. Like, you would get a better image quality if you simply turn off the ray tracing. And this game is supposed to be one of those big air quotes. Oh, it's ray tracing. It's amazing. The graphics are amazing. But they failed to make the PC version of the game up to snuff with the other versions of the game on the consoles. Now, one good thing, though, opposed to that, is I did notice that when I was playing at 240Hz like the refresh rate it was amazing like i was watching some of my friends who are streamers playing this game and one of them in particular shout out to hylian fox um, when i was watching her i could see the difference between just a regular 60 frames you know 60 hertz and the 240 hertz like i was literally getting more movement in the trees I was watching like branches move around faster, I was watching hair on the enemies moving around faster. So that was pretty cool. And that was a nice little treat for me because this is the first game I've been able to do that with because I only recently got my PC. So it was really nice to see the huge difference there. Um, actually one more thing real quick is the beginning, right when you start the game and you see the little scarecrow thing. Like, all that stuff was moving way faster, too. But because of the ray tracing thing, it's like, I, I just turned it off. I, I had to. And so, unfortunately, I couldn't really experience that. But, to be fair, it's not something that's really important. And it's something you don't really notice. So, it's not really a big deal. But it is just kind of disappointing that it wasn't able to be implemented to the point that I was hoping it would be. There is a lot more I can go into when it comes to the differences between PCs and console, like the way that the game is different, but I would not be surprised if a good 90% of you have already rolled your eyes and clicked off the video, so instead of actually going into it, I think I'm just going to move on. So let's talk about something that I actually liked about the gameplay. I love Resident Evil 4. Now, I also feel 
like it is the game that pushed the franchise down the whole action road that we know of today. It's kind of the reason why they actually had to make Resident Evil 7 kind of go closer back to its roots. Um, that's a whole nother story. We're not going to get into it. I did make a video about RE7 if you want my thoughts on that. But I love the inventory system in this game. The, the whole inventory minigame thing has always been one of my favorite aspects about Resident Evil 4. So I'm really, really happy that they brought that back. It's really fun when you get the guns and you got to try to figure out a way to get it all in there so that you can have as much as possible. It's almost like a Tetris little mini game. It's awesome. It's awesome. I love it. I also love the fact that we got the merchant back. Now, how a fat man on a wheelchair can get to all of these places before Ethan does is beyond me, but we're just going to look past that for a moment. Uh, I like how they implemented the whole hunting system. Um, it's something, if you had told me at one point, hey, dude, one day Resident Evil is going to have a system where you hunt for food and then you make something to eat, I'd be like, you're crazy and you need to stop playing Breath of the Wild because that's never going to happen. And lo and behold, they did it. And it actually does something beneficial for the game. I, I really appreciate the fact that you can you can basically get your life. It'll be way higher. You can make it so that when you get hit while guarding, like you take almost no damage. Oh man, I can't wait to get into that. Like, guarding is overpowered in this game. But we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, actually hunting food and having it serve a purpose... It was something that I actually rather enjoyed, which is crazy because I honestly didn't think I would care. And I never thought I would actually be the one that was saying, hey, let's continue doing this. So I do hope that comes back in Resident Evil 9. I really hope the merchant comes back. If they're going to do this whole action thing, right, they want it to be just action, not survival horror anymore. And it's action horror is what it's become. Then we need systems like that. Now, this game, it's not open world, but it isn't necessarily extremely linear either. And I do kind of like the fact that in this one we get to explore, you actually get some of the classic Resident Evil backtracking. You get that feel because there's a lot of areas where you have to go back, you know, to make sure you got everything that there's like little puzzles where they don't tell you where you're gonna get there's this one in particular there's this like you have to find a ball and you put it into it's like a vending machine and it gives you a crystal uh, some kind of crystal skull and you sell it to fat man and you get a lot of money for it lay whatever they want to call it now that isn't to say that there aren't any issues with the whole inventory system one thing especially with the merchant is if you are going to go this action horror route why can i only buy five shotgun shells not that i really needed the ammo because i played most of this using my knife um but still you would think i'd be able to buy more ammo especially once i get to like the bosses i guarantee there's going to be casuals out there that are going to freak out I'm like oh my god i have no ammo you know thinking that they have to kill every single enemy that they come across and it's kind of a double-edged sword because you get more money for killing enemies, but you waste your ammunition for killing enemies. But then at the same time, you find crafting materials to make more on your own. So it really just depends, I suppose, on whether or not you want it to be more of a survival horror game or you want it to be more of an action game. Because you really could play it as if you were playing a survival horror trying to save everything that you come across you know every bullet you know, like i was saying me just because of who i am because of the way i play resident evil games i always try to conserve ammo since we're talking about ammo i might as well just go into this now why did they implement a guard button it is overpowered and broken like you don't even need to run or try to escape from enemies anymore aside from lady d all you need to do is sit there and, and block. You can literally sit there and guard, right? Just sit there and guard and you'll be fine. Especially if you go and you get the meal that makes it so that you take less damage when you guard. I'm, I'm gonna put it up on the screen right now. There was one point in particular, I made it all the way up to Lady D's boss battle 
just using my knife and guarding. There was one point in the cellar below, I was surrounded by three different enemies. I just sat there and guarded. As soon as they did their little animation, I hit them with my knife twice, guarded again, and I was fine. Like, seriously, that's all I needed to do. It makes no sense to me. It's baffling why they would do this. Um, I suppose maybe they're doing it to make it easier for the casual gamer. But still, like it's you, you need to be able to dodge this stuff. That's part of the fun of these games, right? When you can just guard everything, then why, why try to dodge anything? At least with Resident Evil 2 Remake, the knife, you could damage it and it would break. Right? That was fair. I feel like there should be some kind of guard break for this game. That you take a certain amount of damage and you can no longer guard. They really need to implement something like that. Because anybody that knows this is just going to exploit it. And they're just going to guard everything instead of trying to dodge. Which defeats the purpose. And I guarantee there's no way the developers were sitting there making this game thinking to themselves, Hey, let's break our own game. Let everybody guard everything, and then they can just cheese their way through the entire game. <laughs> Why? Why would they do that? There is no good answer, because there's no good reason for this to be in the game. But moving on, let's talk about puzzles for a moment. Now, there are puzzles in this game, but the puzzle basically consists of find this thing, put it in this slot. And to be fair, the Resident Evil games have always kind of been like that, but I really would have appreciated it if they could have made some more complicated puzzles or something, because these ones were just super easy. It felt like the game was holding my hand the whole time and being like, hey, look, man, this is what you need to do. Now, the only thing I could say against that is some of the layouts of the interiors really are quite confusing. Maybe this is different. Correct me in the comments if it is. But on the PC, I can't just grab the map and then and scroll it, right, to, to look at different sections on the same map. For some reason, I have to flip through the menus again to get to the next section, where, whereas with other games, you can just click it, you grab it, and you can just move it a little bit, and you can see what's going on. So that would have made way more sense to me. It would have been way easier if they could have done that. The game's pretty. It is. And uh, I've heard people say, you know, it looks like concept art come to life. It really does look like that. And it's the first time I feel they've been successful in doing that, at least with Resident Evil. So it is pretty to look at, but it is kind of claustrophobic. I wish the areas could have just been maybe a little bigger. That, that would have been really cool to you know, make the village like this entire thing that you can explore like this huge village. I honestly think that the village in Resident Evil 4 was bigger than the village in Resident Evil 8. Why are we doing this thing nowadays in video gaming where we're going backwards, we're regressing? We should be making bigger games. We should be making better games. We should have more to our games, but we don't. Why? Because of graphics, because of technical limitations. That's bullshit, guys. It's not true. Look how powerful the Xbox Series X is. The PlayStation 5 is. Modern PCs are now. They could easily make bigger games, but they don't because the development time takes way longer to make bigger games. Imagine how cool it would be to be in a world in not even the entire size of, say, a Skyrim map. Let's just say a fourth of a Skyrim map. Play a Resident Evil game in the fourth of a Skyrim map. That would be fucking awesome. You know it would. It would be amazing if we could do that. But of course, we can't. So again, why is Resident Evil 4 bigger than Resident Evil 8? Again, there's no good answer to that. Aside from the developers didn't want to spend the time to do it. And the reason why it bothers me so much is because spoilers guys I'm about to talk about something that's a little this itty bitty bit of spoilers right here so just be warned after you beat Lady D and you get the first flask you go to the pedestal and you realize holy crap there's four flasks that I need to get what at that time I, th I was about to think hey this is the best Resident Evil game ever 
I thought I was about to be playing the best Resident Evil game ever. I was like, holy shit, dude, I got three other places I need to go, plus probably a fifth. Because in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, maybe you get all the flasks, and then it goes down and it opens up like a spiral staircase. I thought that would have been a really nice little touch and nod to the original Resident Evil. And then we go down into like a lab or something like that. You know, because RE2 Remake Lab, you know, RE3 Remake Lab, those games just came out. I was like, okay, maybe they're making a connection, right? And I was so excited. I was like, bro, that is cool. That is so cool. I'm sitting there thinking that I'm about to play these three other huge areas, you know, because the castle was pretty big. You know, the castle takes quite a while to get through it. And, and so I was sitting there thinking this, it was going to be amazing, right? I could not wait to play the rest of the game. And then you just kind of hit a breakneck pace from then going forward. You know, it's, I think there's like five or six rooms in the next area before you fight the next boss. And you don't even fight the next boss. You're at the dollhouse. You know, she takes all your things. Hey, check this out. So in that area, I'm playing it. And I swear to God, I thought that I had fucked up. I thought that my computer was messed up because I took a break, I saved it, I left. And then I came back and all my shit was gone. And of course, me being an idiot, um, <laughs> I didn't realize that it was supposed to be like that. So I was freaking out, man, thinking, holy crap, what's wrong with me? Uh, but luckily, yeah, you know, that it was actually what was supposed to happen. But it was really disappointing once I realized that I'm not really going to fight this thing, I just stab it in the head a few times with my trusty knife and guard again and make it through. So then you go to the next area and now that's when you fight the fish man. And again, I'm like, okay, cool. You know, maybe this area will be bigger, you know, and, and the guy ends up being some wacko that throws up all over himself. And again, there's like five or six rooms before you fight him. This game doesn't feel like a fully fleshed out game. And that's what bothers me about it. Because it's a lot like, again to use Elder Scrolls example here. It reminds me of ESO. Right? Elder Scrolls Online, it's good. It's not great. I personally don't like the whole mechanics where... It's basically like a World of Warcraft where you push a button and you do a special skill. Almost kind of like Diablo 3, but that's a whole other story. Um, but it's like a theme park, right? It's not like you're actually in Tamriel. It's like you're visiting a theme park. And that's what Resident Evil 8 feels like. It feels like a theme park version of what Resident Evil 8 should have been. As opposed to feeling like the actual Resident Evil 8 and like this huge masterpiece of a game and we don't get that you know it's just basically run through kitty land with some dolls you know run through whatever you want to call it with the fish man and then you get to the factory and I mean at least the factory was bigger so I do appreciate that uh, it, it had a whole different aesthetic though that I just didn't like I really enjoyed the early like Victorian Gothic theme that they had going on. We get to the factory and all of a sudden it's like an industrial kind of theme to it. And I really, I really couldn't get into it. And to be 100% honest with you, by the time we got there, I was hating it so much. I was hating the factory so much that I was starting to fall asleep while I was playing it because I just wanted it to be done and over with. Which is funny because at one point Heisenberg throws you into, you know, basically down to the bottom level of the factory. And you have to go through all of this crap, right, just to get back up to him. And he throws you down again. And Ethan's like, oh my god, shit, again? I gotta do this shit again? That's exactly how I felt. I just sat there. I was like, dude, I have to beat it. I have to keep playing so I can make this video... But I don't want to, because luckily Chris was there to help us, and Chris was there to save the day. Um, but man, I was so annoyed. I was like, please, God, don't make me go through this factory again. Please. No, I don't know. It's just weird. It's just It almost feels like there was two different teams working on the game. 
or one team was making the beginning of it, you know, doing all the gothic stuff that they had, and then another team was like, oh, we're gonna make it look industrial, and then they made the factory, and if you've been staying up on the Resident Evil news, you've probably heard the controversy about some guy, you know, claiming that uh, Resident Evil stole his ideas for monsters. Uh, I have to say this, let me say this real quick. It's my date the video, but it's fine. Number one, I don't think he would win if he sued Capcom for it. And I don't really think that he has too much grounds to do so. Yeah, there is one monster that looks incredibly similar to one of the monsters in the factory. But I mean, when you're trying to make industrial monsters, guys, how many different kinds of monsters can you really come up with? Given enough time, I guarantee any of us will come up with almost the exact same monster that we're talking about here. And if you're wondering the one I'm talking about, I'm talking about the one with the fans. And you remember how, like, some of those um, monsters, they have, like, these drills for hands? I mean, you know, if someone said to you, hey, make factor monsteries, I guarantee one of us would come up with most of those ideas, too. It's, I mean, there just really isn't that much you can do. So, I don't really give that claim very much credit. But, you know, if he thinks that he can win a lawsuit, go for it. But he's probably going to lose, let's be honest here. Now, one thing I will say in terms of environments is I really enjoyed the whole snowy theme that they have going on. It's something we haven't really experienced much of in Resident Evil aside from Code Veronica, and it just looks good. Uh, I don't like the werewolves. <laughs> Anybody who's seen any of my old videos knows that I hate this whole werewolf and vampire idea. But I do have to admit that I like the execution of it. And I did feel like they really were able to integrate it into the world and have it actually make some sense. As opposed to it just being dumb, right? Which, to be fair, I mean, a lot of it is kind of dumb. And we'll get into it into the story beats when we get there. At least they tried, right? And unfortunately, I can't even say that werewolves are not canon to Resident Evil because they've already been in the Resident Evil comics. So there's already precedent set for werewolves. And once I figured that out, once I learned about that, I kind of gave it a pass because there's no way I can sit here and but oh, it's not Resident Evil. I mean, the comics, man, like they came out a long ass time ago. I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, they came out before Resident Evil 4. So they're closer to the classic RE feel than most of, the, hell, even the monsters in RE4. Imagine that. Werewolves are closer to classic Resident Evil than Chainsaw Man from RE4. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, but, but anyways, they weren't bad, and they were kind of uh, frightening, except for one thing, and that is that the enemy AI is just stupid. It's dumb. They're idiots. It's really easy to manipulate them. You pretty much just go into a shack anytime that you're getting overran. You just you just kill them all. And since we're talking about combat, l let me mention one thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about the hunting for food issue that was going on. That actually kind of breaks the game too in its own way. And, and that being is you can get a dish that permanently increases your health. And if you play New Game Plus, you go into the next game with that increase along with a lot of the inventory now let's say you go up a level right you go up a difficulty level but you get that you get that boost in health you know what happens you've effectively made the game standard difficulty on hardcore difficulty now obviously there'll be less ammo because that's kind of how it is with the hardcore difficulty but if you can get that power up then you'll take almost the exact same amount of damage as you would if you were playing regular standard mode. Why this got through like Q&As and game testing, I have no clue. I don't know if they did this on purpose because they felt like the casuals would never be able to beat hardcore or they would get too scared. Because remember guys, like they, they made this game purposely less scary because people were bitching and saying that Resident Evil 7 was super scary which it wasn't but yeah so if anything i could totally see that's why capcom did it like that because they were trying to make it easier and more accessible for the newcomers to the series which is one of the main reasons why we have the whole first person perspective 
in the first place is because they were trying to make it more appealing to the masses who didn't want to play the tank controls who for some reason didn't supposedly didn't like the whole over the shoulder thing but here's the problem with first person when you are playing a game in first person it's naturally going to not be as scary as it could be if you had the tank controls the tank controls right like yes it was a product of limitation but the reason the original Resident Evil was so scary, why RE2 was scary, why RE3, although more action oriented, was still kind of scary and kind of put you at the edge of your seat, it's because you never knew what was coming around the next corner. But in this game and in RE7, you're always looking in front, you always know what's going to be there, which makes the developers take shortcuts to scare you like jump scares jump scares are cheap guys like i hate it when these companies they they just use jump scares to be like hey look at our scary game you know it kills creativity completely stifles creativity because if you want to make something that's truly terrifying like psychological horror is way better if you have not played soma soma terrified me and it wasn't really a scary game. The reason Soma terrified me is because you had these robots who thought they were humans because their human mind was implanted into the robots. And to me, that's terrifying. Like, Soma is an awesome game. I should make a video on that game someday. That's how you do psychological horror. This game is not scary whatsoever. You always know what's in front of you. You always know how to take out the enemy. And it's not even like you have very limited resources or something like that. Which is a survival horror game. It's supposed to have that, but it doesn't. Because it would be too hard for the casuals. Right? So they give you plenty of ammo. You know, and they make you run through it. Guns blazing. And that's just where we are. And it's, it's sad. It's sad and it's disappointing. Because honestly, it's cheap horror tropes. I really don't feel like this is the best they can do you know what i mean even the evil within was scarier than this game and personally i didn't think the evil within was that scary but it was scarier in this game and by the way to all the people out there that are like oh no man you know it's the original resident evil team no it's not dude do you not know who shiji mikami is he did not make this game why are people out there being like oh okay, it's the same people why are you guys bitching why are the classic re fans bitching because it does not have the original people it doesn't all right so please stop saying that so let's talk about the boss battles man i don't really know how to feel about this one so the bosses do remind me of resident evil bosses right they're pretty standard resident evil bosses and i don't know if maybe it's just me because i've played so many resident evil games but the bosses were extremely easy to me like Lady D, right? Like, I mean, spoilers, guys. Sorry, spoilers. If you want to skip this, that's fine. When you finally fight her, you just run around in a circle and you shoot her. Repeat, run around in a circle, shoot her. Repeat, run around in a circle and you shoot her again. And that is the entire boss battle. And it was super easy. She was like the first boss. And another thing about that is right before you fight her, you find this dagger. And it's supposed to be like a dagger that kills gods, you know, or some shit like that. It was pretty cool. I thought it actually would have been pretty cool if you could take that and replace your knife with that. But unfortunately, you stab it into Lady D one time and then it's gone. It falls down the side of the castle and you never see it again, which kind of sucks. Because it would have been really cool if you could actually use that um, against enemies. Like maybe it could be like some kind of one hit kill. Or something like that because I mean we're already going full action so since we're going full action why not give us something like that which by the way guys there actually is like a lightsaber in this game which is pretty cool go out of your way to try to get that but you do have to go all the way through mercenaries then you have to get like an S rank on every single mission to even get it so good luck with that that's gonna take you a little while yeah well I guess it's not as bad as resistance and who cares about RE verse? Like, I'm not even looking forward to that at all. I'm sure neither, no one else is. But still, it would have been nice. And then, you know, you, you fight the doll maker, whatever you want to call her. And obviously, that's like a scripted battle. It's like a puzzle boss that DSP is always talking about. But except it's extremely easy. 
And then you got the fish guy. Would, that was the only boss where I really felt like it was kind of hard to beat. But then once I realized there was explosive barrels there, it became really easy. And again, it's just this game, it really just caters to casuals. You know, make sure that it gives the casual fan every advantage possible without making it too hard for them. Right? Like, you're going to put explosive barrels all over the place. Now, to be fair, some of the other games did that too. Um, but for the most part, like especially in RE1, the bosses really weren't like that. I just wish we could go back to at least over the shoulder and uh, I'd prefer the whole pre-rendered background thing but I know I'm kind of a fossil um, when it comes to that kind of thing I like what I like and that's just all there is to it so the bosses were very underwhelming and I mean the last boss was just garbage and it was it was just generic the boss flies around shoot it in the head uh, flies around some more, shoot it in the head, flies around again, blah, blah, you uh, you get it, you get it. You know, the only boss battle that had any, like, originality to it was the fight against Heisenberg. And don't even get me started on the whole sequence with Lady D's daughters. You know, I mean, those were just so easy. It was just open a window, they get cold, it weakens them, and you kill them wham bam thank you ma'am you're done it just should have been more it could have been way more but again we're here in modern resident evil land so i guess what should i expect and touching upon that is the chase sequences which is very very far and few between lady d is just not that intimidating i found myself wanting to run towards her way more than i ever wanted to run away from her you know so why would that scare me it's you know the mr x thing it was good the first time but it just feels like they just can't do it any better than that even nemesis who should have been like mr x on steroids it was just garbage you know it was always a scripted event it, w it was nothing like resident evil 3 the original where he could just kind of show up in random places depending on the choices that you make and it just wasn't scary at all you know nemesis was actually kind of a joke unfortunately and so, therefore, in this game, Lady D is just kind of a joke, unfortunately, you know? And again, she's not scary at all. And it's just, for some reason, the game feels way too much like Resident Evil 4, I feel. And I kind of hope that they're not actually making RE4 Remake at this point. I'm actually honestly hoping that the guy who leaked that, maybe he saw some of Resident Evil 8, and he was like, oh, this is just like Resident Evil 4. It's got to be Resident Evil 4 Remake. Because they seriously took a lot of those elements and put them in this game. So if RE4 Remake actually comes out, you know they're going to reuse all these assets. I mean, this game gave us another boss battle with a fish. So are we really about to play Resident Evil 4 Remake and have the same fish battle again? And then be inside the castle again? And here's a, here's a good point to that, if you don't believe me. The same crates in this game that they use are the exact same crates that they used in Resident Evil 3 Remake. The only difference is, is instead of tape, they like painted over them. You really think I'm not going to notice that, Capcom? You really think I'm not going to notice that? They even reused the same little handle that they've been using since RE7 for the garage. In the scene where Lady D cuts your hand off in the dungeon or whatever that is. The exact same one. Look. Go back and look. It's the same thing. Like, for real, guys. Can you please stop doing this? I mean, I understand if you want to take the base model. But at least alter it to the point where we can't tell. And it's really weird because this game has like this weird like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of mentality. Where they do shit like that. But then they have all this attention to detail, you know, finding out that Zoe was a reporter now and that she reported about everything that happened in Resident Evil 7. Like there's a newspaper clipping you can find. There's a bobblehead from RE7 that's actually in Ethan's house. And if you go up to it, he's like, why do I even have this? I should just throw it away. I was like, yeah, dude, you're fucking nuts. Like, why do you want to remember this bad, terrible shit that happened to you? You know, but again, 
it's just juxtaposed against some of this other stuff you know about the reused assets it's you can see that they did put love and time into this game they just didn't focus everything on it and it's like come on you guys are obviously capable of doing this stuff so why not try to go above and beyond and now the real answer to that question is probably simply because there's basically air quotes here been an edict that's been passed down from the higher ups in capcom that they want to release a resident evil game every year that is terrible news for us terrible news for us because if they actually do that then the quality is about to dip down again we're gonna have resident evil 6 all over again now one thing i forgot to mention uh when we were going over the whole merchant thing is uh the whole upgrading your weapons idea I know I'm probably in the minority here, but I don't really like it, and I'll tell you why. When you upgrade a weapon, it only gives you like 0.7 seconds or like 0.3 seconds, something crazy like that. I'm talking milliseconds here. And sure, once you fully upgrade the weapon, it does make at least somewhat of a difference, but it's such a minute difference. That if you're just good at the game, you don't really need it. Which basically renders that whole upgrading weapons idea kind of pointless. Uh, another thing about that is, advice to anybody playing these games for the first time, don't upgrade your beginning weapons. Because eventually you're just going to get weapons that are better, and you're going to want to upgrade those instead. So don't waste your money on the old weapons that you have when you start the game, because, you know, it's just stupid it's better to save the lay the money for you know extra inventory space maybe heals if you need them things like that there's really no reason to upgrade the beginner weapons especially because they're just going to be obsolete soon anyways but that touches on something else that bugs me is i preferred the way the old school games actually handled their upgrades for example, one of my favorite upgrades was in Resident Evil 3. In that one, you can actually find custom parts for your handgun and basically turn it into like an automatic handgun that actually has like a, a scope on it. You can't really do that here. You know, you can add certain parts, but nothing to that extreme. And I would honestly rather have that than be able to upgrade my reload time by 0.3 seconds. You know, it'd be way, way better, and especially if they gave you those upgrades on maybe the beginning weapons, it would make more sense to keep those weapons and then actually upgrade those right out of the gate. But the way it's set up now, there's really no point in doing that, which is why I really don't like the whole upgrading your weapon system. And if there's anybody out there that's sitting there screaming at the screen right now, being like, hey dude, earlier in this video you said that you love Resident Evil 4, I do like Resident Evil 4, but I hated that upgrade system in Resident Evil 4 too. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was bad in RE4, it's bad now. Again, I'm probably in the minority, but that's just how I feel about it. So I know that by now, it probably sounds like I'm just dumping all over this game. And that is fair for you guys to say. So, let's talk about one thing that I thought was very impressive, one thing I very much enjoyed. Earlier in the video, I was talking about attention to detail and how they actually were able to flesh out this world in the little space that they actually occupied. And the reason I was saying that is there's a lot of things that most players will miss, especially on their first time playthrough, if they didn't know it was there and if they didn't know to look for it. For example, Mother Miranda's daughter's grave is actually in the graveyard where the statue is at the beginning of the game. Her grave is literally there. It blew my mind when I found that. When I saw that, it was just like, wow. And I remember the uh, on the grave, it actually says, you know, you're dead, but you won't be dead for long. Of course, which, of course, is what this game is all about, is Mother Miranda trying to get Rose so that she can resurrect her dead daughter. So the simple fact that they took the time to include that there, and it's not even like they're rubbing it in your face. Like, you have to go out of your way and read the individual names on the gravestones to even realize, holy shit, this is Mother Miranda's daughter right here. Yeah, and it says that she died, like, I think it was like 100 years ago or something like that. So Mother Miranda obviously has been planning this for a very long time, which just gives more credence to the whole this kind of being a prequel um, to even the original prequel, which was Resident Evil Zero. Um, that's all I'll say about that until the story section. 
but yeah it was just a really cool find and the simple fact that they even included that at all was was just something that i thought deserved recognition not only that but this game also actually has a lot of unique bosses that you would never know even existed unless you just happen to stumble upon them. Uh, another one, for example, is uh, Claudia's grave. There's a gravestone on one of the graves. It's broken in half and you don't know where the other piece is. And there's no way for you to figure out that puzzle until after you've already killed Moreau. And at that point, it's supposed to be blocked off, right, at that point in the story. So you have to walk all the way around and backtrack to get back to that gravestone. And eventually you find the other half of that gravestone and you put it into the grave. And it triggers a scene where like this giant was protecting the gravestone. Now why this giant's protecting it, I don't know. But the simple fact that you had to backtrack to figure that out it was really cool and like I was saying earlier it really gives off the whole backtracking feel from Resident Evil um, in the classics now a lot of people they don't really like it I don't have a problem with the backtracking in the Resident Evil games it doesn't bother me at all especially if they do it right and in my opinion this right here is how you do backtracking right so that was just another thing I wanted to to point out there and if you haven't done that yet maybe start another playthrough to go out and find it see that's what i mean when i say attention to detail like you can do a lot of like secret events in this game that you were never expecting to be there and it also really helps out in the fact that it gives you a reason to do second third fourth playthroughs they really went out of their way to make sure that this game was not going to be boring by the time you played it for the second or third time. Now, if you're one of those people who went through the first playthrough and tried to find every little thing, then yeah, okay, you know, you're just one of those people and you're probably not going to get as much value out of this as someone like me or maybe a casual who's never really played these games before. But honestly, I would not be surprised even if you are that guy that unless you use the guide online, there's still probably things that you didn't even know were part of the game. Uh, another one is in the very beginning, right? When you get attacked, you get swarmed by the werewolves. You can actually kill the leader of the werewolf pack right there. Now, it doesn't change anything, really. All it really does is give you another crystal skull that's going to be worth a lot of money to you. Um, you still have to fight him later on. And it would have been really cool if you could just kill him there and then that was it. But the thing is, is he's so powerful that it's hard to do it on your first time. Because you really need, like, Wolfsbane. Or at least have a, a, a weapon that's strong enough to take him down relatively quickly because if you can't do that especially on your first playthrough like you're going to get fucked up period now i'm only going to talk about one more of these because i'm not going to sit here and ruin every single you know surprise that the game has in store like that but you know how when you play a game like look at oblivion again right where you get to the edge of the map and there's just like an invisible wall there and we've all run across that while playing games we've kind of trained ourselves to just know oh, okay you know there's a bunch of bushes right here that probably means i can't go past it and i have to keep going straight so there's this one in particular where he's a cannibal and he's living in this cabin off the left hand side of the path that you take when you're going on your way to the factory and the thing is is it looks it looks right like it's just a bunch of bushes where the path is but if you actually walk through it you can actually go through that path and you walk a little ways up and eventually you find a cabin and there's just this grotesque cannibal sitting there like eating crap you know there's like yelling and screaming going on and one actually it's a really good place to find a bunch of poultry and, and meat and fish things that you need for the recipes because it's all over this cabin and i thought that one in particular was just really really cool especially because you know like i was saying a while ago we we are all trained to know that we're not supposed to go a certain way in these games so for them to actually include something like that where it kind of plays on the whole normal convention of video games it really really was something that i thought was special and they deserve praise for all of these secrets that they were able to include in this 
to this degree. Yeah, I mean, I call it like it is. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. I'm an honest guy, and I know a lot of times people, they don't like my channel because I talk a lot of smack about Resident Evil, and I'm not doing this just to appease you guys. I genuinely think that those were really, really smart inclusions to the game, and I'm very happy, for one, that they actually did this. Okay, so now if you are still here at the 50 minute mark, just let me say thank you very much for watching my video. We're not done yet. I'm about to go into the story and I have quite a few things to say about the story. Um, but I did want to mention first that these videos are really hard for me to make. Um, I work a full-time job, blah blah. You guys know the YouTube spiel, so please subscribe and hit the like button. I'd very much appreciate it. If you don't want to, that's fine. I'm no sponsor. I hate it when YouTubers do that crap. So with that being said, I feel like that's enough already. Let's be done with the gameplay part of this video and let's move on to the storyline right after i tell you about raid shadow legend no i'm messing with you guys uh, i couldn't help myself all right, right. storyline time let's go okay guys so unlike my retrospective videos i'm not going to be posting every single cutscene in the game and then like explain what's going on and give my thoughts on every single cutscene we're not doing that this time what i'm gonna do instead for the purposes of this video is i'm basically just going to have a discussion with you guys uh, i apologize if it seems a little random i did not make any kind of script for this section i'm simply going to give you my raw thoughts on the story so with that being established we're going to start off right from the beginning which is the opening cutscene capcom never ever 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 please don't ever do this again i could not stand the whole nightmare before christmas jack skeleton opening garbage I, I hated it i guarantee there's people out there who loved it not gonna surprise me at all but it does not belong in a resident evil game resident evil is not a cartoon guys okay please don't ever do that again uh, next up is we start the game with ethan and mia and uh ethan needs to go and take rose up into the room so obviously he does pretty standard stuff it's been years i think it's uh three years since the whole baker incident happened and mia's still acting like a bitch now i'm not gonna lie i thought that was the real mia i really did only because in resident evil biohazard mia was a stuck-up bitch so she really wasn't acting that much different compared to the way she was acting in resident evil 7 for now we'll just say she doesn't act much different right so she gets shot and it looks like Chris probably shot her through a wall, or Chris's ninjas, right? Um, probably shot her through the wall. And uh, at this point, I'm super happy. I'm like, yes. Look, I'm not an advocate for violence against women, but Mia was a fucking bitch. I want to bring one thing up here. I called this shit. Like, I knew for a fact that there was no way Chris Redfield was going to be the bad guy of the game. There's just no way. He is not the type to go out and just kill, right, like, a woman, like, or even anybody. He's not gonna kill anybody unless he has a damn good reason to do it, because that's who Chris Redfield is. Now, I've been hearing people talking about how they're like, okay, yeah, Chris, he could totally be a bad guy, and they don't understand his character, or, or why he didn't tell Ethan what was really going on, and why he was being so shady, why he was being so secretive. Let's take a walk down memory lane for a second. Resident Evil 5. Chris literally watches his partner die in front of him, jump out a window, right? She sacrifices herself, Jill, to, to kill Wesker. And for all he knew for years, she was dead. So he had probably had, you know, some PTSD because of that. What happens after that game? Resident Evil 6, he watches his partner die. Pierce, right, sacrifices himself for him. Are you seeing a connection yet? What happens in Resident Evil 7? Chris watches his men die, some of them sacrificing themselves to save Chris. This guy, every time he has a partner, every time somebody helps him, they die. So of course he wouldn't want to tell Ethan what was really going on. Of course he wouldn't want Ethan to get involved. Because every time he gets other people involved, they end up dying. 
And ironically enough, what happens in this game, guys? Ethan dies. It's pretty fucked up, if you think about it. I feel bad for Chris after this. But you can't say that it doesn't make sense. Because it does. This is exactly why Chris is being so secretive. This is exactly why Chris is acting the way that he is. It's because he has gone through all of this crap before this game. At this point in the story, he probably feels like he is the only person who can take out all of these bioweapons. And I guarantee the people that's with him, he probably didn't choose them. They were probably appointed to him through Blue Umbrella. Right, like they're supposed to be the best of the best. If it was up to him, he probably wouldn't even have a squad. But he does, and he's letting them do it because at least these people are willing to sacrifice themselves to stop these bioweapons. But it's not like Chris is going out there and just being a complete asshole to Ethan and not telling him shit because he hates the guy or something. It's actually the opposite. It's Chris likes Ethan. He doesn't want to see Ethan get hurt, so he tries to keep him in the dark hoping Ethan will not go to the village. Now, why he takes him is another story. Obviously, he was going to take him to make sure that it was Ethan and that he wasn't infected with something else that maybe Miranda might have given to him because we find out that this Mia that Chris killed was not Mia, it was Miranda. It was Mother Miranda, which is why he had to kill her, you know. One thing I will bring up though, is after this happens, right, they take him away and they get Mother Miranda, they put her into the back of a truck. Number one, why is the body in the same area that Ethan is? Number two, dude, how many bioweapons have you taken out, Chris? How many times do you kill the first form of a monster and they don't come back to life? You should know better than this. Seriously, come on, Chris. That was a rookie move, and honestly, I kind of look at it as being kind of a plot hole because it really doesn't make sense. Chris should know for a fact, and because later on, they're like, oh, well, who would have guessed that a corpse would come back to life? Dude, Chris, come on, bro. Every one of your enemies come back to life. Even your dead partner came back to life. Now that we're talking about Jill, where the fuck is Jill? I mean, I understand that, okay, maybe he doesn't want to put her in the line of fire. To be fair, she probably has more business to be in the line of fire than Chris does. She is a super soldier at this point. What is she doing? You know, I mean, is she just somewhere in a cabin sitting, enjoying her life? You know, like Scarlet Witch at the end of WandaVision? Like, what the hell is going on? You know, she would be such a huge asset to Chris right now. Like, she could help out so much. She's basically Wesker 2.0. So, where the hell she is, I don't understand. But, predictably, Mother Miranda comes back to life and uh, destroys, you know, the, the little truck or whatever it is that they have them in. And uh, steals Rose when they get close to her village. Which, why are they going to their village? You know, people out there are probably sitting there thinking, well, obviously they went to the village so that they could take out the rest of the bioweapons. But, I mean, Ethan and Rose are still in the truck. Take Ethan and Rose somewhere else first. You know, you want to go to the village, that's fine. Go there, you know, destroy the bioweapons, but at least drop Ethan and Rose off somewhere safe before you go to this village that's infested by lichen monsters and the molded like come on you know why were they driving it doesn't matter anyways so that's basically the beginning of the game ethan you know he wakes up he doesn't know what the fuck's going on uh he, he gets a phone call he, he listens to them and they're like you know where the hell is miranda blah 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 and uh, he basically just runs off you know he tries to go into the village because he needs to save his daughter and so I'm gonna be honest with you guys, so I'd say a good two to three hours in the beginning of the game are it's rather uneventful. So I'm just gonna kind of give you a quick summary of it until we get to the next interesting plot point. He goes into the village, uh, he gets attacked by the werewolves. After that, he finds somebody who lets them into their house. Then the werewolves find him, and they kill everybody there except for one woman and then the woman basically commits suicide by not taking Ethan's hand and just letting herself fall into the flames. After that he makes it to Lady Dimitrescu's house and when he gets there he's basically stalked by her and her daughters throughout the entire time that he's there. Now real quick I will mention that I do like how you find the files that talk about Lady Dimitrescu's daughters 
and you find out that they're not like really vampires that basically they were given this experimental the cadeau or whatever Miranda calls it and uh, they're one of the first people to get it and pretty much flies ate their bodies and then reconstituted their bodies with fly bodies and that's why they were able to turn into flies and fly around and all that I actually like that I thought that was pretty cool I give them props for that. Um, it is still kind of weird, but it's not as bad as the vampires I thought we were going to get. So, after that, Ethan kills them, all the daughters, and then he eventually kills Lady Dimitrescu, and then he gets the first flask. And this is the part that I thought was really good, because I was not expecting for Rose's head to be in the flask. That blew my mind when I saw that. I was like, damn, that is fucked up and then you find out that the four flasks that you need to get are believe the remaining body parts of rose and that mother miranda was actually trying to use her to resurrect her own dead daughter which i thought was really good too and it made perfect sense as to why you know, mother miranda went to such lengths to try to get a hold of rose at the beginning it's because Rose basically has like superhuman powers. Uh, we'll talk about that towards the end of the story, but I just felt like that was a really good way to tie it all together. So after that, again, we're gonna skip forward a little bit. He, he goes to the dollhouse. You don't really learn anything cool there. You kill a doll. You fight a giant baby monster that's crying, fetus monster. After that, you go to Mon Monroe, and this whole time, I'm like, dude, where the hell is Chris? Like, why is... He didn't want Ethan to get involved before, and now here he is, not doing shit, and just letting Ethan do his own thing. He knows that Ethan's in the village, and instead of doing anything about it, he's just letting Ethan do whatever the hell he wants to do. It doesn't matter. So, we fight Monroe, and right before we get there, that's when we finally figure out what's going on with Chris, and he's basically researching all the bioweapons him and his squad and they're trying to find weaknesses and trying to stop him. Chris tells Ethan to basically go home and it's like dude no how are you gonna tell a dad to go home when his daughter is in peril like that which by the way I really actually enjoyed how Ethan went on this character arc right in the Resident Evil Biohazard he was just kind of a pussy pretty much right but in this game he's kind of turned into the quintessential action badass and I thought that was a really cool character arc for him i feel like he has made a lot of progress and it actually makes sense in this game that he would be way better at dealing with these situations than he was in the past so again i give them props for putting it together like that so after moreau we go to the factory heisenberg is actually trying to start a mutiny against mother miranda he actually hates mother miranda for what he or she did to him which is basically make him an experiment and he's making all of these factory monsters. And I can only assume at the beginning it was because he wanted to take down Mother Miranda. So that's why the factory monsters are there. At some point you finally make it through the factory. Like I was talking about earlier, it takes forever. It kind of sucks, but that's a whole different story. He gets thrown back down to the bottom level of the factory. And it turns out Chris is there doing research. And I guess he was working on some kind of mechanized weapon and other take down Mother Miranda, presumably. Um, but this is where we get the big reveal that Mia, in the beginning of the game, was actually Mother Miranda, which we talked about earlier. And again, I called that shit. Like, I knew for a fact there's no way Chris is a bad guy, period. So I was really happy when that happened. But then after that, we get this boss battle between Ethan and Heisenberg. And I have to say, personally, I feel. I don't want to say it's the worst boss battle in the game, but I really didn't like it at all. I mean, it turns Ethan into like a mech warrior. You know, he's using uh, basically a tank. It's like a, a weaponized tank thing that he's using to fight Heisenberg. Um, he takes him down at one point, like Ethan gets thrown into the air, you know, and he even like gets back into the mech that he was ripped from in midair and finally kills Heisenberg. And then we see mother miranda this was pretty cool too so ethan i wasn't expecting this ethan goes to confront mother miranda and she reveals to ethan everything that's going on with rose about how she wants to bring her daughter back to life and she needs rose's body to do it because rose is probably a mold monster too and she kills ethan literally rips his heart out right in front of him 
and then just breaks it above her face and bathes in his blood. It was gruesome as fuck. It was pretty metal. So after that, we cut to Chris. And I want to say really quick, this section with Chris was fucking awesome. Like, this is the Chris that we know. This is the Chris of old. I mean, the guy's even sitting there smoking a cigarette. Like, he was pulled straight out of Resident Evil 1 or something. And so it was really awesome to see Chris actually being Chris, especially after all these people thought that he was going to be a bad guy. It was really cool to see that not only was he not the bad guy, but he's the, he's the same Chris that we all know and that we all love. And so this was the best section of the game to me. And you can really tell the difference between Ethan, who I don't want to say he's a rookie, he's more of a novice, I guess, um, but he can still definitely hold his own. But you can see the big difference between Chris and Ethan in this section. Like, Chris is just mowing motherfuckers down, right? He is just shooting people left and right, taking out lichens, you know, the reckless abandon. He just doesn't care. And at this point, he thinks Ethan's dead, so I'm sure he's got some rage inside of him. Because he, he had to watch another one of his friends die. Right? Another one of the people that he cares about die. And he just plows through all of these people. And then we get to Mother Miranda's lab. We find a couple of interesting things in her lab. First, we find the jar of the Kado. So we learn that she's the one who's been doing the experiments. And she's the one who's been infecting people with this virus. The Minamyce virus. Um, or the mold, if you want to call it that. One thing I thought was really interesting was... So you find a note. And it's actually a letter from Oswald E. Spencer. Yes. Spencer from RE5, the same guy that we learned, the same guy that started Umbrella, and uh, it turns out that Mother Miranda was his teacher. I don't really know how I feel about this. Part of me likes it, because at least they're connecting, right, both of these games to the overall storyline of Resident Evil, which is good, because for the longest time, I know a lot of us classic fans were thinking, how the fuck is this even a Resident Evil game? But, I don't know if I really like the fact that they're retconning the beginning of the series again. This is like, what, the third time that they've done this? The first one was RE0, second one was RE5, and now they're doing it again. And, I, I mean, I know that they're probably running out of ideas, but I would have just preferred it if we just got something new, I guess. It doesn't have to all tie back to Umbrella. If you want to have it tie back to Umbrella, bring that little girl back from Revelations too. I mean, they already established that Natalia is probably Alex Wesker. That Alex Wesker was probably able to actually get her mind into Natalia and take her over. So we have that loose plot thread out that they have not addressed yet. And I really, I'm really hoping that it just is never addressed. I'm really hoping they bring it back at some point. Why make that in the first place unless you were going to bring it back? And especially with the rumor of this being Revelations 3, it would have made sense for maybe she ends up becoming Miranda or something like that, right? I mean, Miranda in this game is, is even blonde. In fact, now that I think about it, you know, because she was brunette in the picture. Nah, we're not going to go there. There's no way that was actually Alex Wesker. But still, it would have been a nice little inclusion. And it would have been cool if that's how they did that. It would be an easy fix. So why they didn't do that, I have no idea. Uh, the next thing that happens after that is we finally find Mia. She had been locked in the lab this whole time. And what's weird about it is... Mia's being all goody-goody and smiling at Chris and all that, and I understand it was probably because the developers wanted to show that, hey, look, guys, this is the real Mia. You know, she's being all nice. See, she's got to be a, the good Mia. She's not the evil Mia who was being a bitch at the beginning of the game. But honestly, like, if I was Ethan and I was looking at both of those Mias, I'd probably think the nicer one was the fake Mia. But that's a whole nother story. We find out something very important here because Mia tells Chris after learning that he air quotes died that he's probably not dead and that Ethan is special and what does she mean by that well this is where we get the bombshell that back in Resident Evil Biohazard the first time you come across Jack when he hits you he kicks you in the face Ethan died at that point Ethan has been a mold monster the entire time 
which I loved this and I called this shit too because I remember I was talking in one of my other videos that Ethan has superhuman healing right it's not like you, know, you could just take the chem fluid and put it on your hand and that's why he's he's healing no he was obviously infected he's been infected the whole time and somehow he's special because he was able to procreate and that's actually why Rose is needed for Mother Miranda to resurrect her daughter. I guess the Metamyce is like the hive mind, pretty much, of the mold. And if you can find a specific consciousness that has been put into the mold, you can revive that person. Given you have a suitable body for that consciousness to go into, hence Rose. And we know this is true. Right? We know it's true that all of these consciousnesses that get infected by the mold go back to the Metamyces because right after this, we actually see Ethan having a conversation with Evelyn, who is still alive in the mold. I like this too because one of my main gripes about Resident Evil 7 is I felt like it was too paranormal. Right? Like, Resident Evil's always been a series that is more based on science. Like, even though, yeah, there was giant spiders and all that, and I know people are probably going to say that kind of thing, like, oh, it's giant spiders. You know, that, no, dude, that's not paranormal. Okay? That was science. That, that's what the T virus did to the spiders. So, obviously, it's science. That's not, again, not paranormal. Because you go in there in Biohazard and you talk to Jack while in the mold. And I always felt like it was super supernatural and I didn't like it at all. But now we see that it's not a supernatural thing. It is kind of based in science because all of these consciousnesses, they all go back to the Metamycene. So that's how Ethan is able to have a conversation with Evelyn, even though he's supposedly dead. Because even once he dies, he probably goes back to the Metamycene, which we're going to talk about in a theory after I finish this story section. I have a couple of theories, but I really, really like that, and I really thought that was a good inclusion there too. So after you find out this, sure enough, Ethan wakes up, and Duke takes him to Mother Miranda for the final battle. But at this point, Ethan is pretty much slowly dying because he lost his heart and I assume it's because he's lost his heart we never really got a better explanation for that maybe he's just taken too much damage over the course of the game and uh, he's basically starting to crystallize like the rest of the mold monsters do right before they die so with his last bit of strength he does save Rose who has been resurrected at this point through the ceremony but luckily Mother Miranda's daughter's consciousness wasn't put into the body, at least we don't know if it was yet or not, uh, but presumably it wasn't, and uh, Ethan takes out Mother Miranda. After this, Chris finds him, and they're going to escape together, but Ethan knows that he's not long for this world, and that he's going to die very soon, and he makes the ultimate sacrifice play by sacrificing himself and staying behind so that Chris can escape with Rose and destroying the hive mind of the Metamyces. After this, we only get one more scene, and that's at the very end of the credits. And at the end of the credits, we see Rose visiting her father's grave, now a teenager. Uh, she visits her father's grave, puts some flowers down on the grave, and then heads back to the truck. It turns out she's some kind of agent now, presumably working for Blue Umbrella with Chris, and uh, one of the guys even kinda gives her shit and calls her Evelyn, which really pisses her off, and I don't blame her. I'd probably be pretty pissed off too. For all we know, she can talk to Evelyn because of the whole hive mind situation. Then again, maybe everything was disconnected once the hive mind was destroyed, but we don't know if that's the only one or not. And the interesting thing is after this, you see the car driving down the road and then you see the car stop next to a figure. People are saying this is Ethan. Maybe it is. I know they use the character model for Ethan there, but that could easily be explained away with them just picking a model that happened to be Ethan um, for them to put into the cutscene. But I do feel like there is some significance there and the fact that the car stopped. It wouldn't have stopped if there wasn't a reason for them to stop. So again, for all we know, maybe Rose is now connected because she may be the last living member of the mold. Maybe she's the new hive mind. We don't know yet. Maybe she is the new hive mind. Well, aside from Mia, that is because Mia is still alive. But we'll see in further games. One more thing I forgot to mention, we'll mention real quick here, is during all this going down, the BSAA, Chris's old unit, 
they release soldiers into the village and they're they're not even soldiers they're like zombies which is weird as fuck because now it's like well what the hell is going on with that which really gives us a reason to look forward to resident evil 9 because uh, after this chris is probably going to have to take down the bsaa depending on what it is that they're doing and I don't really know where they're going to take Chris's character from here, but I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that wherever he goes, he will probably watch somebody he cares about die. Most likely. But with that being said, that's pretty much it for the story, guys. Um, I'm going to go through and talk about a couple of theories that I have about the end of the game and just about the game in general. And there really isn't that much, but we will spend a little bit of time on it and then we'll call it a quits after that. So let's move on now to the theory section of the video. Okay, so the very first one that we're gonna talk about since we were just talking about Rose is I don't think Rose is actually a teenager per se. I think she probably ages faster than normal humans. Hence why the guy was calling her Evelyn, because Evelyn did the same thing. She aged very quickly. Now, I don't necessarily think that Rose is going to age as fast as Evelyn did, seeing as how she was a natural birth and not something that was created in a lab, but I would not be surprised at all if it's only been like three or four years, maybe five, six, after the events of Resident Evil 8, where that cutscene takes place. Along those same lines, I also would not be surprised if somehow Rose is now the main hive mind for the Metamyces. She was brought into the world by this weird ritual that Mother Miranda did, and was, the ritual was never completed. So I would not be surprised at all if eventually what we find out is because the ritual wasn't completed, what it pretty much did was it gave the Metamyces a body and a consciousness, which is now Rose. So basically, instead of like the hive mind dying at the end of Resident Evil 8, what really happened was that consciousness transferred into the body from the ritual, which is Rose. And that's why she's so powerful, because I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that she's probably overpowered as fuck. And the reason for that being is she is going to end up becoming the Metamyces manifested on Earth, which is how she could be talking to Ethan at the end of the game. And it also would not surprise me at all because that'd be an easy way for the developers to be able to include scenes with Ethan in the dream state, right? They could easily include scenes with Ethan with Rose being able to talk to her dead father and maybe get advice and for all we know she might be able to talk to every consciousness that was ever within that hive mind which would give her an infinite amount of knowledge because see you might have been wondering okay if she's only five six years old how is she so smart for her age that could easily be explained away by simply saying that she has all of the knowledge from all of the people that were in the Metamyces, which would make her one of the smartest people on Earth easily. Okay, so this next one is admittedly kind of far-fetched and out there, but I mean, this is Resident Evil, and a lot of Resident Evil is pretty convoluted, far-fetched, and out there. So just give me a minute, because it's going to take a second. It's going to kind of be basically two theories in one, but hear me out. So we now know that Spencer was training with Mother Miranda. And that's kind of how he learned about the Megamyces, about all these different viruses, yada yada. So he eventually leaves, and in the timeline he goes to Africa. Now, we don't know if he took a sample of the Megamyces or not. What we do know, what we learned in Resident Evil 5, is that supposedly, eventually, he finds a flower in Africa that ends up being the base for the progenitor virus. But they could easily retcon things again because they seem to be pretty retcon happy and simply say that what really happened was Spencer took a sample of the Megamyces. He found whatever part of the virus it was that was controlling people and bringing them back to life. He isolated that, put it in the soil and grew this flower that could easily be what happens. Now, why am I bringing this up? Lady Dimitrescu's daughters, they end up turning in the flies and their bodies become reconstituted to make them the living dead, right? 
basically vampires or zombies. Does that remind you of anything? Because it reminds me of something. Marcus in Resident Evil Zero becomes a leech monster because of the progenitor virus. It could very well be that the progenitor virus is simply a different variation of the Megamyces. It's a pretty big coincidence that the two earliest versions of a virus in this series both created a kind of monster that could separate itself into different bodies, one being leeches, the other one being flies, and being able to reconstitute itself into one body. Now, that's not the crazy part. This is the crazy part. If this is true, then that means the Metamyces was able to take people's consciousness from the T-virus and the G-virus as well as the progenitor virus. Because all of these viruses come from one source, which, and hear me out, could mean that there might be a way to bring back Wesker. I know, I know, I know, look, I love Wesker, and I would love it if Wesker came back in the series, so if I can latch on to any hope, no matter how small or you know that chance could be, I'm going to latch onto it, all right? So how could this happen? Either one, the Metamyces has more than one hive mind, or two, maybe that's what Resident Evil 9's about. Somebody is trying to bring back Wesker. Maybe Alex Wesker, in Italia's body, knows that the consciousness of Wesker is still within Rose. And that could be why Rose is in danger. And it can also be a great way to conclude the story and make everything fit together. They could literally end it at 9 and it would be one giant loop. So it'd be pretty cool. But again, I know, it's pretty nuts. But I just thought that was something interesting and I wanted to bring it up. Man, you don't understand, like, this whole hive mind thing about the Metamyces really opens up so many possibilities for the future. If they really did kill the hive mind, it makes sense why they did it. Because this could be the proverbial can of worms. So many things could happen now if the virus is able to store the consciousness of people who have been infected with the virus. Shit, even Steve could possibly come back <laughs> because of this. So, again... If they did destroy the hive mind for good, that's probably why. Because they knew it could be this giant can of worms that they were not ready to go into. But then again, it would be the perfect way for them to be able to explain away bringing back people from the past who were supposedly dead. So before we get to the next theory, and I'm sorry for this guys, but there's one thing I forgot to mention when we were talking about the storyline, is... The whole thing with Ethan being a mold monster was actually done very well. It was very well implemented. Like, there was actually a lot of foreshadowing showing us that that was probably the case. For example, um, Lady Demetres, when she tastes Ethan's blood, she's like, oh, it's going stale. Of course it's stale, because he's been dead for years, which is why it's stale. Or her daughters, constantly calling him a man-thing. Why? Because he is literally a man thing. He's literally a mold monster. He's not a man. He's not quite a monster. He's a man thing. Which is why they call him that. I just wanted to toss that in here real quick. On to the next one. Alright guys, so this is probably going to be the last one. And this one is one that I always like there to be a reason for things to happen in games. So I always try to kind of use my own headcanon, I guess you would call it, to figure out why certain things are in a game. So this one is about Duke. And the theory is this. Duke is the fifth lord. He is the head of the fifth clan in the village. Why would I think that? It's pretty coincidental that nobody attacks him. Even though he is fucking huge and he would be easy prey for the werewolves. Nobody ever attacks him. Now, I'm not stupid. I know that the real answer is just simply gameplay or mechanics, right? That's most likely the real answer here. But if we're trying to figure out a way to make it make sense within the world, within the lore, 
it could be that he is actually the lord of the fifth house he's already been infected most people who have been infected can transform maybe he can too and maybe that's how he's able to get everywhere because maybe his transformed state isn't this bumbling fat guy maybe that's just what he looked like when he was a human and when he transforms he's able to move around it also explains how he's able to get into all of the lord's manners it's because he's a lord himself and that also explains why nobody ever attacks him because they do not attack the other infected that's one thing you'll notice in the game if you look around is they will constantly attack the humans but they don't seem to attack each other so that's it and um, i'm gonna call it guys if you're still here thank you very much you all have a great day thank you very much for listening to the video please like comment subscribe all that um i could go into more detail with these theories if that's something you're interested in then make sure you put it in the comments if enough people actually comment on the video i will do that for you i'll make an elongated video of just theories with more proof and uh, more reasons why i believe them to be true so thank you all again and have a great day i'm out